we have to do? We're all wired for what do we have to do? We're all programmed to do something to earn our salvation. Hence, people of all religions ask the same question, what do we have to do? For some Jews, the answer comes in 613 commandments demanded of them from the Tanakh. And for Buddhists, they have the Eightfold Path. For Muslims, they have the Five Pillars. For the Roman Catholics, they have the Second Sacraments, uh, Seven Sacraments. Modern-day professing Protestant Christians, in spite of their Protestant doctrines, uh, are sometimes, unfortunately, not immune to this tendency. For some Christians today, the answer to what do we have to do can be as subtle as a few steps to your best life now, as seen in Joel Olstein's Your Best Life Now, seven steps to living at your full potential. With this, with his non-threatening smile, he suddenly places seven steps on your shoulders. These seven steps are what you must do to live out your full potential. And in a similar vein, uh, the slogan, What Would Jesus Do?, burdens Christians to live a life of incessantly asking the question, What would Jesus do? Every decision you make, every move you make, every thought must be filtered with that question, WWJD. Now, on the surface, this practice may sound noble, but trust me, if you sincerely apply this question to every move you make in your life, this constant nagging question will place such a heavy burden on your shoulders that ultimately it will crush you and crash you and burn you out. And just as arduous and rigorous uh, of a version of what we have to do comes from the holiness movement. These advocates often require of Christians, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow, perfect? <clears throat> Holy like God? When was the last time you met anyone who fulfilled that command? In reality, uh, all these motos and these techniques and methods are never-ending things to do, which is actually law. They are, in a sense, various forms of works righteousness, attempts to live moral, holy, and perfect lives in order to merit or to secure salvation. And this is what we call works righteousness, salvation by works. And it was not taught by Jesus. So, what would Jesus do is not gospel. Gospel doesn't ask, what would Jesus do? No, it asks, what has Jesus done? What has he done to save sinners like you and me? But what do we, uh, but what do we have to do is how we are kind of wired to think all the time. Even during Jesus' time, in John chapter 6, we see the crowd seeking Jesus to find out what we have to do. They want to do the work God requires, but Jesus already knew they couldn't. Hence, he says to them, Do not work for food that spoils, referring to their works, but for food that endures to eternal life, referring to Jesus' works. The Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. For Jesus to say to the Jewish crowd, Do not work, and that he would give them eternal life, would have gone against the grain of their thinking. Hence, without even missing a beat, they asked Jesus straightforwardly, what must we do to do the works God requires? To this, Jesus replies, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. You notice Jesus does not give them a list of do's and don'ts to attain salvation because from their track record and from their sinful nature, he knows they cannot do the do's and don'ts. 
to this point, Scripture repeatedly states, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Jesus, in John chapter 6, verse 29, gives us the answer. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. You see, the operative word here is the word believe. To believe in Christ and his word, his promise. Just as the first generation Israelites in the desert, in the wilderness, they failed to believe in God and <coughs> his promises, <clears throat> and so died in the desert just short of the promised land, the believing, the unbelieving Jews in John chapter 6 also failed to believe Christ's promise. And as a result of the quote-unquote hard teaching, they left Jesus. So what can we learn here? We should not ask, what do we have to do, as the unbelieving Jews did, but to instead ask, what do we have to believe? Jesus says to the crowd, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. In a later incident found in John 8, Jesus warns the Jews in Jerusalem, You shall die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. He later preaches good news to His disciples, that He will free them from the slavery of sin. It is in this context of Jesus' message of justification and salvation that some Jews, in order to justify themselves, invoke their pedigree. Abraham is our father. Unfortunately, the non-believing Jews could neither accept nor understand what he was hinting at, for they could not hear, they couldn't believe his word. Then Jesus rebukes them, saying, I speak the truth, but you do not believe me. If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? In Jesus' rebuke against them, the unbelieving Jews the operative word, once again, is believe, to believe in Christ and his word, his promise. Jesus, knowing the Jews desire to do things for their justification, rather than to believe in him for their justification, respond, then do the deeds of Abraham. Jesus was actually, in fact, speaking figuratively of the deeds of Abraham. Jesus was not referring to an actual good deed Abraham did, for he did absolutely nothing to merit his salvation, to save himself. Instead, Jesus was referring to what Abraham did. That is, Abraham believed. Genesis, Romans, and Galatians all verify Abraham's belief. Abraham believed the Lord, and God reckoned, God counted, he credited, he considered, in the Koine Greek, logizomai, God logizomai him as righteousness because of his faith. Now, logizomai, the word logizomai, comes from, the, uh, from, from accounting, and it means to reckon or credit in one's ledger. So in the ledger of life, when God logizomites, he reckons, he counts, he considers Ab Abram righteous for his belief. He removed Abram's debt, the list of sins from his ledger book of life, by first transferring his sin and guilt to the sinless and, gu uh, and guiltless Son of God. He took our sin, our guilt, our shame upon his cross, on the cross. For the wages of sin is death. As a result of the cross, Abram's sins were not reckoned or charged against him. Instead, he was considered righteous because all his sins were reckoned to Christ. So we see from Scripture that it was not Abram's deeds, his works, 
that declared him as righteous. No, the very thing Abram did and the only thing he could do for his justification was believe. In our scripture reading from Romans, Paul states, if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. Because to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is reckoned, counted, credited, considered, logitsamai, as righteousness. Thus, for us, the ungodly, to be justified by God, we must trust, we must believe in His promise of salvation rather than work to do something for our salvation. For it is only by believing, placing our faith in Christ and His promise that we will be credited a God-given righteousness. And Paul explains, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is our father in the sight of God. Because Abraham believed, God gives life to the dead. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was reckoned, it was logitsamai, to him as righteousness. Hence, God's promise of salvation, that is giving life to the dead, comes by grace through faith alone, and was reckoned righteous, what is the title he is given in Scripture, the Father of all who work. Is that his, is that his title in Scripture? The Father of all who work, or the Father of all who do? No. His title is the Father of all who believe. These passages in Romans support emphasis of the Protestant Reformation on solely believing on the promise of salvation for our justification. In protest against the Roman Catholics adding of the works of the law to the formula of salvation, the Protestant Reformers affirm the biblical doctrine of justification Sinners are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone. So opposed with the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestant Reformers' view of justica uh, justification by grace alone, through faith alone, that at the Council of Trent, one of the most important Roman Catholic ecumenical councils, a decree was ordained, it says, If anyone says that by faith alone the, th the sinner is justified, let him be anathema. That is, let him be cut off from salvation. Let him go to hell. These official Roman Catholic decrees clearly prove that the Roman Catholic authorities, instead of 100% trusting in Christ's life, death, and resurrection, as a basis for their salvation, need to also include the works of the law into their formula of salvation, as is clearly seen in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Second Vatican Council confirms all men may attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. The requirements that we have to actively work to attain our salvation, that is, observe the law, is the same erroneous error made by the Judaizers in Paul's day. In uh, Paul's stern letter to the Church of Galatia, Paul contends the Judaizers' inclusion of works of the law in order to attain salvation. As he did in his letter to the Romans, Paul once again, in his letter to the Galatians, powerfully proclaim, proclaims, in line with the Protestant view of justification, faith over works for our salvation. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. This is kind of long, so if you'd like to turn with me, um, it says in, in, uh, in the ESV, Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14.
Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we Protestants can completely trust what God promises in His Word. Salvation belongs to, comes from, and is of the Lord. If it is true that salvation comes from the Lord, then we can fix our eyes upon Him for our salvation, rather than turn our eyes uh, to ourselves for inherited, inherent righteousness that comes from our supposed good works. Because you see, Christ is the source. He's the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. A faith that is in the gospel, in Jesus' perfectly obedient, a substitutionary death and victorious resurrection. This gospel grants us the righteousness of God by faith alone. It is a free gift from God. And if it's a free gift, we can only but receive it, not earn it. And if we did not earn any of it, then no one can boast. And if no one can boast, we are left to boast in Him and in His work alone. And if it is all in Him, His work, then, we des then, he, deserves, then he deserves all the glory. And if He deserves all the glory, then let us channel all our praise to Him alone, solely Deo Gloria. Praise God. Let us be glad in the Lord and rejoice. King David also praises God and is glad and rejoices as he too makes the same declaration of his justification through his Savior, his Messiah. In view of his great sin, David's lust, his adultery, his murder, his deception and pride, he speaks of his blessedness as a result of God crediting him righteousness apart from works. He says, blessed are those whose trans transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the, is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. This amazing grace David received is due to the object of his faith, the Messiah to come. David's faith is articulated in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. It says, Because David knew that God had sworn to him with a promise to seat one of his offsprings on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Because of the resurrection of Christ, the first fruit, David was confident that his soul too would not be abandoned at his death to, to hell, to the grave. As he looked ahead with faith to Christ's resurrection, he could also look ahead to his own resurrection and so be glad and rejoice knowing his flesh would one day dwell securely forevermore. We see this looking ahead in faith in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. We see, we go through uh, the patriarchs of, of our faith from Abel to Enoch to Noah to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, etc., etc., etc. 
They all looked ahead to the Messiah, the promised seed that would crush the head of the serpent, the seed of the serpent. And this good news is for us even to this day. We too, like our patriarchs, Abraham and David, can now be glad and rejoice in the promise of the Messiah and in the justification given to us by grace through faith because of the victorious resurrection of Jesus that took place 2,000 years ago. Our patriarchs look forward in time through faith to the same Messiah that came. We can all together, as one cloud of witnesses, praise God for his fulfilled promise of the Messiah, the Almighty, who is and was and is to come. Praise God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we worship you, Almighty God. We marvel at your greatness, your sovereignty. Only you are truly holy, set apart from all sin. Through your word, we know that in your holy presence we cannot abide, for we are wretched, depraved, all doomed for destruction. Yet in spite of our sinfulness and in spite of your holiness, you, O oh God, have mercy upon us, forgiving us all our sins on account of your son's sacrifice on the cross. You have justified us, setting us apart, us as a remnant, as your people. We give you praise. How we cannot help but be full of great gratitude because of your grace and mercy and love. How we cannot help but be awestruck by your plan of redemption to seek and save the lost. So Father, we want to express our gratitude again. Thank you, Father. Still, O oh Lord, we need your help. Although we have done, although you have done so much for us, we succumb to our sinful nature. We fail to yield to your spirit. So, Father, we ask that you will forgive us and consecrate us and purge all the evil within us. We believe in your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just to forgive us and to clean, cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. We know all your promises are always yes. And amen. So we want to thank you for forgiving us of all our sins. Thank you for imputing upon us the righteousness found only in Christ. Lord, we also want to pray for our family, friends, and relatives, and neighbors who have not yet come to same faith in Christ. Oh Lord, free them from the clutches of Satan's lies. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Soften their hearts. May they yield to the Holy Spirit, drawing and turn to you so that they may realize the sufficiency of your grace. Lord, I further pray for those who do not know you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, for, uh, Lord, I also pray for those who do know you, brothers and sisters in Christ. May you use us as an instrument to spread the good news to the nations. We also want to pray for our leaders uh, during this turbulent time. May you give them wisdom. May the nations turn to you for comfort, peace, and salvation in the face of the threat of another rise of COVID cases due to another deadlier strain. We pray for your help. We pray for those who are infected in this time of turmoil. May people repent and turn to you. We pray for reformation in the land that many will repent of their sins and believe in the true gospel for their justification. We also want to lift up our brother in Christ, uh, Pastor Norm and his family. His mother has died and has trusted in you, so we thank you for that. May you bring comfort and peace to those who loved her, to her family, her friends, and relatives. We look forward to Pastor Norm returning to shepherding us. We thank you that he has been faithful in feeding us the good news. We thank you that you have fed us your gospel today. We pray all this in your son's precious name.